I want to stress what I'm about to say I have absolutely no evidence for. <laughs> it's just things you read. So everybody knows, not, maybe not everybody, but Apple makes a lot of hardware products, but they're, I think they may be the only major PC maker that has a serious silicon design operation in their company. And that's, you know, if you have an iPhone or an iPad or uh, any of the mobile de uh, devices, not PC, not, the, not Macs, that's an Apple chip in there. They don't build it, but they design it. And there are rumors that they're looking to replace, they use Intel processors. Famously, they switched many years ago to Intel processors. It's worked out very well for those of us who use their Mac. Um, but uh, there are rumors that since they do have a lot of expertise in designing processors and they've been doing it on high volume things like the iPhone, that they might just switch the Mac over to ARM and not use Intel anymore. Is that a possibility? Well, or what's your yeah. I, so I don't have any insight into you know. Okay. Clearly, they're not going to open that project up to me if they do have it. Uh, uh -huh. But you know, our perspective is that, um, especially with Apple, they're they're very competitive and they always, you know, Apple lives on having the best product with the best performance, best battery life, you know, form factor, all, all of that. Our job, um, and, and so I, I actually believe that somewhere inside that company, probably somebody is always trying to see if they can use their ARM-based cores to scale up into that space. They, they, they'd be, as an engineer, I think they'd be foolish not to do that test and see whether they can. Our job is to make our product so compelling, the performance, the battery life, and to work with them on on integrating their features in, from, from uh, their OS, Mac OS, to be accelerated by our hardware, such that, that the, the performance and the, the cost advantage is always there to use our product. So, so we always look at it as a competitive market that we have to win at Apple, but, but, and almost at every other of our customers, right? There's always, whether it's, it's AMD or some other ARM competitor, there's always somebody trying to get uh, our market share. Okay. Now let's talk about the future. Uh, you're in the middle of a big pivot, and so you, are, you already ticked off a few things, but start with the cloud. Um, what's your role in the cloud, and how, how big is it, and, and how much farther do you think it can go, and who are your competitors? So, um, so I read your, your final article yesterday. Yeah, thank you. I read that. And, um, you know, I, I think you commented that ubiquitous computing is going to be everywhere, right? That, that all these things, and, and the key to those things being interesting and, and really helpful in our lives is going to be the cloud, right? As they're, because they'll be connected, now you can aggregate the data because just one individual piece, you know, if I just get your heart rate, it's kind of interesting, I can trend it, I can tell you when it stops. But what I really want to do... I might know that, or somebody <laughs> might know that. But what I really want to do is compare your heart rate to my heart rate and to everybody's heart rate in this room and start gathering analytics against it. And the cloud allows that, right? So all of those devices have to be connected to the cloud in order for them to really add value. Yeah, I mean, so in other words, one of the things I said on TV after that was, you know, somebody's asking me about it because I was talking about ambient computing. And so what do you mean? I said, well, look, the walls are going to have sensors and sure. processors and, 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 and connectivity, the carpet, the clothing we wear. In fact, the last time you were at our conference, you wore a shirt with some yeah. sensors in it. Um, and, but what you're saying is that's all just local unless it goes to the cloud. And it's not just a question of storage in the cloud, right? The cloud no, it's, does... it's analytics, right? It's, it's when I can gather all this information you know, and I can start to char char characterize your energy usage at your home versus the energy usage in everybody's home in this room and start to give you uh, artificial intelligence, learning, ideas, thoughts, or start to run your home for you in an optimized way. I know when you come and go, all of that will be done. Because yeah, the, the walls will, will say, oh, there's three people in this room. Now there's two people in this room. Right. Maybe and we'll, the temperature needs to be changed. Right. And we'll adjust the, the thermostat. And we'll yeah. adjust everything about your house, the lighting, all of that. That's, that's all going to be done in the cloud. And, and that's where the power is. Now, now for Intel, this is, this is part of our pivot. 
we don't think of ourselves as a CPU company anymore. We, we make the best CPUs on the planet, but we think of ourselves as a, a, a data company and in that we are the people who produce the products that are going to collect, do the analytics, the storage, and, and then the, the, the transmittal of all of this data. And in the cloud, we think of ourselves as a rack. We, we look at now not, not just the server CPU, but that entire server rack. And we're totally trying to optimize the performance and the cost of that. Don't some of the companies, like, I could be wrong about this, but I, I vaguely remember some interview I did, either Larry or Sergey or both of them talking about how they built their own stuff for their servers, even in the early days. They, they do. kind of hacked it together. And uh, they're not the only company that, that's done this. Are they using your stuff or? Yes, so, so we have more than 90% market share of the computing inside the cloud and, and inside data centers in general, whether it's an on-prem or off-prem cloud or whether it's a private cloud or a public cloud. Okay, so I'm just gonna run through a few other things. There's probably many, but so uh, autonomous driving. Yes. Uh, Obviously, e e even non-autonomous, plain old cars, even five, ten years ago, were full of computers, system on chip or whatever they were, under, under the hood. You didn't right. see very much of it in the cabin in those days. Um, were you involved at that point? Uh, no. Were they using kind of custom embedded processors from cheap sources somewhere else? Yeah, if you take a look at the average car today, um, they could have as much as 80 microprocessors inside them. But those are, are small, almost like embedded devices that are out sitting on the brakes, doing anti-lock braking, or you know, helping with steering and skid steering and things like that. The, the reason we went on our acquisitions towards Mobileye and, and really where, where we've gotten uh, engaged in the automotive industry is the car of the future is going to look much more like a server. Uh, and it's going to be connected to the cloud. I don't know if that's comforting to me, Brian. <laughs> no, it, it is. It is because A... So it's going to be, have a ransomware attack on it? Is that the deal? Well, you... you, you no, you, uh, we'll no? put security and... You and, will? Because that's what the guys with the servers said before a couple of weeks ago. Uh, if you take a look at it, though, most, most of the people... That, what we'll do is, um, uh, by doing this, right now you have maybe one device out on your anti-lock braking system. By making it more like a server, now you'll have, say, two 18-core Xeons in there. And we can actually run this as a virtualized machine. So if you get a ransomware or some kind of virus on, on one portion of the device, we'll, we'll have memory backed up. All of the stuff will be in the cloud. We can refresh your car on the fly. While I'm driving, or while it's driving. Absolutely, we can, we can shift the workloads and adjust that. So you'll actually end up with a much safer car. Just like, like in today's distributed environment, it's actually your data is much safer because it's not in one location. Okay. If I take a look at 2016 overall, uh, I look at it as it was one of the big years of transition, probably the biggest year of transition in Intel's history. We had executive leadership changes, and if you take a look in the room today, it's going to look very different than it did, say, last year even at this meeting. And some of the faces are familiar, like Stacy, uh, but they're doing something different now. They're doing something that is grow causing them to grow as leaders, but it's also bringing new ideas and new ways of thinking into those existing areas. And then you're going to see new faces. Uh, the newest uh, I use is Bob Swan, who's our newest CFO but you're going to see it in IT. You're going to talk to Murti this morning. Uh, you're going to see it across the board. And if you go one level down, uh, that same kind of uh, leadership change is occurring there as well. And it's really bringing both an outside-in perspective to Intel, but it's also changing the inside perspective as people move around into new areas. We did the restructuring and reinvestment, which you saw uh, at, in the spring time frame around April we announced. And we are continuing to execute through. And remember, that was both a combination of restructuring how and where we're investing. And Bob's going to talk to you a little bit about that. But also uh, shifting where we're, we're, we're putting our resources 
and our energy into as a company. And we'll talk about that a little bit in my presentation aligned to the strategy. We're doing partnerships and M&A. And so you see something different with 5G where as compared to when we were looking at LTE and we tried to be different, with 5G we're partnering. We're partnering with all of the top uh, equipment manufacturers. We're partnering with all of the top networks across the world. We're doing trials together. We're partnering. We're doing M&A like Nirvana, like Movidius, to bring new technologies and new computing platforms onto our silicon, like Altera. We believe that those are different than what we've done in the past. We're really thinking about this as an end-to-end -end solution. We think we're unique when we walk into a partner like BMW or Verizon or anybody else almost on the planet. We talk end-to-end. -end. We don't talk about a segment. We solve problems. We own problems. We tell them, we'll come in and we'll help and we'll build out your autonomous car network. We'll help with the data center. We'll help with the 5G connectivity. We'll help with the in-car compute. We'll do all of that. When we talk about 5G and we walk into a, a, a service provider, same thing. We talk about the modems, we talk about the day stations, we talk about the data centers. We're able to talk about all of those. And then we believe we bring to that, on a top, silicon and software leadership that's unique. We have the ability to go in and customize parts. If a big cloud provider wants to move their algorithms onto silicon, we can help with either FPGAs or custom silicon. We can provide any level of opportunity that they need. So, our top priorities for 2017, I challenge the leaders with a few. First is growth in the data center. Growth in the data center through our core products and through our adjacencies. It's the number one priority for this company. We must build the second cylinder of this engine. Second is to continue the great work that the team's done in keeping our client business, which I believe is one of the most unique and best businesses just about on the planet, keep it strong and healthy. And I think Murky will come up here and talk to you about the roadmap and strategy they have in this space, and we're very, very uh, excited about it. Second is growth in IoT and these devices that are connecting uh, from autonomous cars to retail to industrial. This is the time to get in, do the design wins, and, and um, start the growth for the next uh, several years. And then we need to flawlessly execute in memory and FPGAs. This is about bringing new products that differentiate. As I said, first 14 nanometer product in the world on FPGA, the most design wins and customer interests in Altera's history, we must execute. We must deliver those. And if we do, the growth we believe in FPGAs can be much, much faster than market. With memory, you've seen the 3D NAND start to uh, grow. Rob will talk to you about the expansion that he has and how he's going to grow that through the rest of this year. 3D NAND is critical. It brings us cost and efficiency and performance in a, in a standard, uh, a more commodity memory business uh, that we believe we can actually make money and grow in uh, in the future. And then bringing out 3D Crosspoint, the Optane technology, that's how we really shift this whole industry. It's important that we flawlessly execute in these two product areas.